Coming from New Jersey, United States, our next speaker is a recent university graduate who's making waves as a software engineer at Audible. He's not just about coding. He used to curate his own weekly newsletter, Weekly Byte, and now he's the go-to guy for the Audible tech blog. Currently, he's channeling his talents into mastering DevOps and making release automation more efficient and user-friendly. Let's welcome Charles Pijora. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. So today, I'll be talking about how we've streamlined the Audible iOS release process. Before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that there are many others that were involved in making the process what it is today. I'm just the one lucky enough to talk about it. So quick little poll. Who's familiar with CICD? OK. Who's released an app before? OK. Who works on a team maybe larger than 10 or 20 developers? And who's part of a release train? OK. So that's a good sign. So many of you might understand why we've actually done this then. Releasing an app is difficult. Audible is consistently in the top charts of the Audible App Store, or the Apple App Store. And to deliver consistently and to deliver a stable app is a struggle. There's many tools and companies that try to do this. And many of you probably are very familiar with the pain points. To give you a sense of what it looks like at Audible, we release the app every two weeks, except when we don't. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> From a QA perspective, we have a team that's dedicated to actually understanding if the app is ready to go out to the store. And we'll talk again about how that's a challenge for us. And on top of that, we have many, many developers and many, many features, which means that we have a complicated branching strategy. You might be familiar with Gitflow, and that means we have many uh, sources of truth within our branches. So from a release perspective, Let's understand what some of the pain was. First, we had a developer rotation. As many of you raised your hands, we shared that responsibility of releasing the app. That means that over many months, each developer might lose context in what the process actually looked like. The process was time consuming. We used to spend a week just to release our app out to the store. And that's a huge amount of developer capacity dedicated to just that one process. On top of that is manual. If you know anything about code signing, it's a pain. And we used to do that on a developer's local machine. And as you can imagine, it always failed. So what does this mean? Our process was inconsistent and unorganized. We didn't have great documentation about it. And often, people changed. So we had a lot of additional people that then we expected part of that process. So what was our goal? We wanted to introduce an automated process, a consistent one, and even one that was out of developer hands. So let's understand how we did that and what the process looks like today. And to do that, you must first understand what tools we used. First, Fastlane. Josh might be in here somewhere. Okay? And if you haven't used this, please check it out and give the open source project some love. It's been immensely helpful in getting some out-of-the-box actions for us to achieve the process we wanted. But when we, when we needed a new process, we used Swift. All of us are familiar with it. So for us, it was the easiest way to add actions when we needed it. For example, we wrote a Swift script that, that would uh, sort all of our uh, commit logs in alphabetical order and numerical order so we would be able to understand exactly what was in each release. Last. Our team uses GitHub, so whenever we introduce a script, it was always backed by a GitHub workflow. That means that then it could be run on a CI machine rather than a developer's local machine. So I'm going to go through 10 ways that we've actually done this. The first is to release consistently. So as I said, it used to be a manual process. And on Wednesdays of release cuts, we'd get this message in Slack. I'm going to cut the branch at 10 AM. But there was always just one more feature or one more pull request that needed just a few more minutes. And then many hours later, we do a last call at something like 6.30 after work. <laughs> so what's the point? 
trains shouldn't miss their departures. I actually got this exact quote from a director when I didn't cut the release. And as you can imagine, I immediately cut the branch after that. So who's been traveling before? And have you maybe missed a train or a bus or an airplane? Okay. And what do they do? They leave without you. They probably wave too, right? Trains leave when they leave. You're either on the train or you're not. And just as with a real train, our release train leaves with the features that are in the main branch. If you don't make it, you need to wait to the next time. But why so harsh? Just as we prevent uh, feature creep, we must prevent release creep. We need to hold ourselves accountable to the features which we've committed to. But most importantly, our ability to release cut on time means that we can better guarantee our ability to deliver an app to the store on time. So, now that I've told you that we should re release consistently, we can now release automatically. And you might say, Charles, cron job. And I say, not so fast. Why? Well, I told you, at Audible, we release the app every two weeks, except when we don't. As an example, each quarter, we have a buffer week, which means that we skip one week at the end of the quarter. And then we have the challenge with holidays, where maybe we have code freezes and we can't release on that cadence. And so a cron job doesn't help us in this scenario where it's an irregular, ca uh, irregular cadence. So what do we do? We check in a file called release dates. This is the source of truth with the year, month, and day that we release the app. That helps us then introduce a script in Swift that checks that file. We first start out by just reading the contents of the file. We split it into Swift dates, and we end by deciding, is today a day to cut the release? We then back this by a cron job that runs every day, so we can actually cut on whatever day as we wish. So now that we've automated the process, we can create the release branch automatically through the GitHub CLI. Then we can push test flight and in-house builds to our QA teams to start testing immediately. They can capture the commit logs, and we can send that to our customer service teams, maybe to the marketers, to understand what's actually going live. And last, we can notify our team through the Slack uh, webhooks to let them know that the process is underway. Next, marketing owns the metadata. Has anyone worked with App Store Connect and tried to upload screenshots, and then you see like the little gray box that it didn't upload? It's, it's really annoying. Um, and as a developer, I wanted nothing to do with it. We used to manage metadata as developers, and honestly, it was a pain. We used to work with our marketers going back and forth, and inevitably, there would always be errors in the process where we miscommunicated a change. So that meant that there was a slow turnaround time, and that's part of that one-week capacity that I talked about. But also, it was error-prone, because now we're trying to understand what the changes that were requested. So we said, hey, marketing, can you own this? And to our pleasant surprise, they bursted out in cheers, quite literally, because now marketing and our teams uh, um, on product could actually own their own destiny. And they could be the source of truth for that metadata in App Store Connect. So with that, treat your metadata as code. I talked about Fastlane earlier. And this is a perfect example of where you can use it with the deliver action. So, we have a repository which we call App Store Metadata Repository. We check in all of the metadata, from the screenshots to the keywords to the release notes. What does that allow us to do? We can version history everything that went out to the store with each release, knowing exactly what the customer saw in the App Store. That then means we have a repository to house all of the scripts and the workflows that someone might need to run. And last, with the Fastlane Deliver action, we can very easily, out of the box, interact with App Store Connect. So what does it look like? It's very simple. It's just a directory structure that Deliver expects with metadata and screenshots in the different localizations that you support. For any that you don't, there's a default folder where you can house anything that all other uh, marketplaces will see. And like I said, because it's in GitHub, we can just open pull requests, and we can request changes, and we can ensure that those changes are the ones we want before they make it into the main branch. But you might be asking, wait, marketing owns this. 
They make pull requests? Yes. Surprising. But the reality is that Git and GitHub, they're just tools. So with a simple training session or a training video, they can learn it too. Next, let's talk about generic release notes. Who's seen this before? Some companies get fancy and they might write like something that's not that, but basically that. But you must understand why that is. At Audible, we support many devices, iOS, iPad, Mac, watch, many different subscriptions, monthly, annual, free trials, and many different marketplaces, different countries. So as a developer, we're trying to understand this exact middle point the intersection where a release note is true for all users across all marketplaces. And that's incredibly challenging, especially because at Audible, we manage our features with feature flags. What does that mean? Well, first, we're trying to understand customer feedback. Whenever we re release something out to the App Store, we're trying to understand how is a customer responding to this feature. And with that, we're trying to ensure that all features live together well. Perhaps there's a crash that's introduced because two features live together and we missed it during QA. So for us as developers, that means we don't have the context to understand at any given point what feature flags are live. So at Audible, we do use generic release notes. And because marketing owns the metadata and they can open pull requests, they're free to change this whenever they wish. But from a developer standpoint, we no longer need to be responsible for making that decision. Next, specify your Xcode version. Does anyone recognize this screenshot? OK, this is an awesome tool, and I highly recommend that you download it. It's called Xcodes. And it allows you to manage different versions of Xcode on your machine. They also have a CLI version that we use for our uh, GitHub scripts. And so what this means is that we check in a file called Xcode version, and that's a file that it expects. It specifies at the branch level what version of Xcode that something builds against. And we then introduce a script. It's called setup Xcode. It runs on all of our Xcode build workflows. And what it allows us to do is within the environment to specify the path with which uh, Xcode version we want to use. So when it reads that file, it decides, OK, I need Xcode 15.0. And it's able to build against that on CI. This is super helpful for us, and let's understand why, though. On CI, we're able to manage multiple versions of Xcode. We can have 15.0, 15.1, and even a beta, perhaps, on an experimental branch. And because it's checked into Git, we have a history of what version of Xcode each archive built against. Now, compilation checks. Does anyone see anything potentially tricky with this code? Maybe the, the compilation flags? So for us, what's the problem? Our PR workflows always run against the debug configuration. So what that meant for us is that we were only ever checking on CI this one code path. But the problem is there's two others. And so for us, we introduced a solution with parallel jobs on, on PRs. That allows us to check different code paths for different configurations. So now we can proactively check the ad hoc and release configurations, knowing before they make it to those branches if there's going to be any compilation errors. So that means now we're more release ready, and our release branches are never uh, having compiler errors. Last, uh, next, auto-generate builds and tags. So for us, this is what it looks like. Whenever something makes it onto the main feature or release branches, we always push that to an in-house uh, build. And whenever something makes it to the release or the hotfix uh, branches, we push that to test flight. So for us, in-house distribution is done through the Apple Enterprise program. And we're able to host those in-house builds through AWS. And with each build that we push through our in-house and test flight uh, builds, we're able to then attach the commit ID and title so that our QA and our developers know exactly what's in that build. Tags. Well, I said we automatically cut the release branch. And so for us, whenever we do that, we introduce a tag with the suffix rc0. That's the first release candidate which we are considering for the App Store. Whenever we push to test flight, we also tag it. And we do that with the prefix tf. 
What that allows us to do is then map within X, uh, App Store Connect exactly what versions of Xcode uh, of, a, of a build are in our Git history. Next, release candidates. Whenever we push something to Apple to review, we mark that with the release candidate suffix and then the number of which build it is. Last, whenever something goes into production, we mark that with the semantic version that is corresponding to the app version. So talking about version and build numbers, let's understand how we do that. The first is that the semantic version is always checked into Git. And the build number is arbitrary. So what do I mean by that? We use an XC config file. And this XC config file is called versioning. What it allows us to do is to specify the marketing version iOS. You'll see it here, 4.1. That corresponds to what we expect in the next release. But you'll see here that the build number iOS is just 123. We're able to override this with just simple shell scripts. And what's also nice is that other platforms can lock against the iOS version, since generally they're the same. Now, making release branch changes. Delays are disruptive. And when we cut a release branch, we're expecting that to be the most stable option for production. And so whenever we make changes to that, we want to um, introduce intentional friction to make changes to that branch. So we've introduced the concept of a release exception request. It's a Slack workflow where a developer first has to introduce the problem giving us an idea of what regression or crash a user might be facing so we can better understand the context for the change. Next, we, implement, uh, we introduce what the code level change is. We're telling uh, managers, product, QA, what the risks and benefits of merging this change are. And then we're also saying how we're going to fix this in the future so we have some actionable items to prevent this from happening again. Last, whenever we introduce changes to release and hotfix branches, we also have a, a workflow within GitHub where two managers have to uh, approve that check. It's not to introduce bureaucracy, but rather to just ensure that there's additional eyes on that change. So we're being very intentional about what goes into the uh, release branch after the fact. So quick bonus, releasing hotfixes. Has anyone released a bug into production before? Quick raise of hands. Yeah. We're all human, right? And it happens. And so for us, that means we've introduced a planned hotfix. Before, hotfixes were always an ad hoc process. Maybe on a Monday, maybe on a Wednesday, we'd you know, introduce a hotfix. But because we're on a two-week schedule, we're now able to release hotfixes on the off weeks. So let's look at what that looks like in reality. On Wednesday, we create 1.0. Like I said, it takes about seven days for us to actually QA that, that build. So we submit to Apple on the following Friday. And then that following Monday, we're generally able to release to the store. So you can see that entire block of time is taken just to get the app from cut to release on the store. But during that process, we're phasing it out, and we're also creating a hotfix. And so here, we create 1.1. That following Friday, we introduce any crash or bug fixes and submit to Apple again on Friday. And then again, we're able to release on Monday. So now we have a little bit of an overlay. And you'll see that with the schedule, we're able to then have this zigzag pattern, where now each week, we have a release and a hotfix, release, hotfix. This gives us a good cadence so that both our developers and our customers understand when things are happening. So let's look back at some lessons we've learned. The first is the best way to automate your process and to streamline it is to remove steps from it. When we were auditing our release process, we went through and actually decided, is this process valuable? What are we getting out of this? And are people actually using it? And oftentimes, we'd find that it actually wasn't helpful. When to stop automating. If you've ever seen the memes about a junior engineer over-engineering something and a senior engineer doing the simplest thing possible, that's the reality. For us, with uh, release automation, we tried to make things simple. And so for us, it often meant that we stopped automating at the point where anyone could introduce the change. So for instance, anybody can click the button on a GitHub Actions workflow. You have to be careful here, because there's a point at which you'll start um, spending more time maintaining automation than just running the manual steps of it. 
So be careful of when you're uh, trying to over-engineer something to decide, have I gone too far? Next is to update your documentation. Uh, I'm sure everybody is very diligent about updating their documentation, uh, but the reality is that the release process is complicated. And so if many people are involved with it, make sure you're always updating it. For us, this is now a manager responsibility. And so because we have this documentation in place, any of them can just run the steps. Last, I know you guys are all inspired and you're going to go back to work and say we can release the app really fast now. But we've been doing this for about nine months now. And so for us, that means we're looking at incremental changes, evaluating at each release, have we done what we wanted, and what's the next best step. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, happy to take any questions. All right, so does anyone have any questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it was super interesting. Um, how much of that process is shared with other teams within Amazon? Sure, so Audible is uh, pretty isolated from the Amazon uh, teams. So for us, we made the process that was best for the Audible team, but that process looks very different for others. Thank you. Antoine, <laughs> this is go going to be a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. I just wanted to say, like, I believe this is your first talk, right? Um, yes. I think you did amazing. Thank you. So, <laughs> really well done. Thank you. Um, yeah, I do have a question, but I think I think it's fine. Um, the overview you showed was like release. Uh, hotfix, release hotfix, and it made it look like you're always doing a hotfix after release? Is that yes. The so the idea of the planned hotfix is that we are always expecting to release a dot one release. Right. And so when we release uh, the 1.0, for example, to uh, production, yeah. we have a workflow that creates the hotfix against that branch. Yeah. And we expect to release that the following Monday. Right. And so that will include crashes, bug fixes. But if there's no crashes or bug fixes, that's awesome and we'll skip that release. Okay, so there's a skip moment as well eventually, yep. right? And uh, I think the release cycle was slower, right? Like, or faster, I mean to say. Mm -hmm. So the hotfix was created, but only four days later it already got submitted? Instead exactly, of because uh, our 1.0 release has already gone through QA, so we're only QAing a very small diff once uh, the hotfix is created. Right, and has that ever run into like unexpected failures due to just testing that part? Um, no, because we're pretty intentional. It gives us an idea of like exactly a small slice that we expect yeah. that changed. And so, again, we're able to spend a lot more time on it. Awesome. Well, it's super inspiring. Uh, I learned a lot. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, I got a question on whether you use the test flight internal and external distribution for potential internal or and external testing. And I wonder uh, how you may have overcome the limitations, right? Because I think internal is just 100 internal testers, and then external, like 10,000. But then you have to go through the Apple review. And it seems like sometimes that can interfere with actual production review processes. So I wonder how do you handle that at sure. Audible? Sure. So if I understand your correct, uh, question correctly, uh, we only do internal test flight testing. We don't do any external. And so for us, we're able to manage that because we have a very select number of people that have access to it. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think, that's, I think so. Thank you. Hi. Uh, mm -hmm. Great talk, man. Thanks. Uh, I think I got a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one, uh, do you folks have like an, any metrics on the amount of hot fixes over time, maybe by the same team? How many false fixes is a, any given team making in a year, for instance? Is there a metric for that or not? So we do track like um, when we released versions to the App Store. So we have the data on like if it's a minor release or a hot fix, and then we're able to track like when it got released 
obviously Apple also gives you that within App Store Connect to see like what actually went out to the App Store. Um, we're less concerned about like having to release hot fixes per se because it's planned. So like we're always expecting to release something basically 52 times a year. Okay, so there's not like any kind of downside for a team to send in a hot fix because there is not like punishment for that. Is what I, what no, I, I mean, the reality is everyone raised their hand, right? When we asked if people have released a bug, like it's a human, you know, trait, like we're, we're not perfect. And so like for us, it's, we're not concerned about that we have to release a hot fix. It's rather that the process is seamless so that we can actually do it. Awesome. And the final one, I leave you be. Uh, sure, sure. Is how do you guys like avoid maybe someone trying to send a feature as a hotfix, mm -hmm. uh, maybe to meet some deadline or something like that? Sure. So, like I said, the release and hotfix branches have to have two manager approvals. Oh. So, uh, you're going to have an interesting conversation if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, thank you. You guys are really good. Cool. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I have one question. The first, two questions. But the first one is uh, the um, amount of time you have uh, for each release mm -hmm. and how you structure your build process uh, basically depends on the QI, QA time that you have for each release. So the release timelines actually align with our uh, sprint schedules. So, for instance, our sprints start on Wednesdays. And for that reason, we cut on Wednesdays because that's when the new cycle starts. Uh, the second question is, um, like, so I think that you, your team considers this um, the possibility of hotfix, so you introduce that into a schedule, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, uh, if you have done uh, or considered, if you reduce it, the amount of changes or reduce the time for release, then it's also probably that you will introduce uh, less bugs. Though. So it, is that something that you have set on stone, or, or are you modifying eventually, or you are just uh, considered like that? Uh, can you repeat I, I can question. repeat the question. Yeah, thank uh, you. Like, depending on the time that, you're, that you have for release, it's more probable that if you introduce more changes, then there's more probability to have uh, bugs, and sure. therefore introduce hotfixes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's. So obviously that's that's a big challenge, right? So features always go behind uh, feature flags, right? But we're trying to align the releases with the sprint schedule. So that's why it, it's intentional that the hot fixes are only stabilizing what went out to production in the off weeks, so that this way we can compensate for that rapid schedule. Okay. Hey. Um, have you ever faced uh, Apple rejection, and who is the responsible of deal with that? Yeah, we definitely have. Um, again, so it used to be a manual process, so that used to be the developer that would actually drive the conversations with Apple. Now that it's a manager responsibility, it's a lot easier to just like have a very streamlined communication. And so we're working. We have an on-call rotation, and so if there's any uh, rejection that comes in, we're able to assign that to the on-call developer to, to fix in the meanwhile. And do you have any strategy to mitigate that with notes for the tester of Apple? Yeah, I mean, we, we give pretty detailed notes, and obviously we're tracking like what Apple has rejected in the past, so that this way we're, we're testing that in our QA process. Thank you. I know you said it used to take a developer a full week to do a release. Mm -hmm. um, since introducing this automation, what have the benefits to your team been from like having that time back? Yeah, so uh, as a start, right, this is no longer a developer uh, responsibility. So it's in manager hands, which means there's one less person in the process at a minimum. Um, because it's just button clicks within GitHub, it could actually be done in less than half a day. And on top of that, that allows our developers now to have time to actually work on features, developer test them. Thank you. Hi, Charles. Hey. Uh, that was a great, uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, the question that I have is, how do you manage the pull request branches? Because there is always a conflict with the 
when uh, we when the br the branch is merged, mm -hmm. all the other branch are stopped because they have to to already have the commit that is already sure. already yeah, yeah. merged. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and that is consumes the time to sure. all other features. How do you manage the the all the feature branches? Yeah, so this is actually a process we've intentionally left manual. So if you remember about like the over engineering, we would spend more time trying to automate like cherry picking, for instance, or back merging. So for us, what we do is any change that needs to be made to a release or a hotfix branch, that goes into our main branch to start. And that's when the Slack discussion starts with the release exception. It gives us an idea of like what PR actually went into the main branch. And then we can evaluate if that's safe to cherry pick in. In terms of the conflicts, because the version file is always referencing the next version, if there's no changes to the release branch, it's always a clean merge back into main. But when it's not and there is a Git conflict, that's done manually just through a Git uh, you know, GUI. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering, um, how do you deal with uh, estimating time or, or allocating time for the hotfixes? Like, do you take the complexity of a task in mind and then use some multiplier to say, like, uh, let's allocate like 0.2% of the estimated time to that, to, to possible hotfixes on this, or? Yeah, so uh, we generally, when we get uh, like bug reports or crashes, like those are prioritized by the managers during a triage meeting. Mm -hmm. And so we decide what's absolutely critical to go out to a customer within the next release or hotfix. And so we'll, we'll spend the time that's necessary to get that out. So, so when you plan the, the sprint, do you have a buffer? So, or, or mm -hmm. because it could be dis yeah. disruptive to the sprint if you don't. Absolutely. Yeah, there's actually a process that we're working on right now where we're actually able to introduce some buffer within the sprints for the lower priority bugs that maybe weren't blocking to the to the production release. Thanks. Anyone else? Hello. Uh, I I have a question about the bug fix, the hot fix you you plan. Sure. Because. In my case, and mostly of the time, the hotfix, you don't really plan it because it seems to appear when you release, mm -hmm. but uh, generally it appears like sometime two, three days after. And if it appears after, then it means that all your flow is broken because the next release will need the hotfix before getting released, but the build has already been created and everything. Yeah, so what's automated in that file that I showed is just the minor version updates, right? So we're always just creating the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. We create the 1.1, 2.1 with a manual uh, GitHub workflow. So we only create that after the branch has gone out to production. So it's actually not dependent on a Monday release. It's dependent on a, a developer or a manager actually executing the workflow. OK, and let's say you you seem to have no odd fix. You mm -hmm. created. A new branch for a new release, and mm -hmm. you need a hotfix after that. Uh, so you're saying like you created 1.0, you created 2.0, and now you need 1.1? Yeah. So in our case, that wouldn't happen because we would create the uh, changes within the 2.0 release. Your marketing so accepts that you don't do the hotfix. Mm -hmm. oh, that's nice. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, I think we're done. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.